I'm Dr. Mike Tranfalia, and for the last 29 years, I have been the medical director and chief scientific officer of Fraxa Research Foundation. Our tagline is finding a cure for Fragile X. I'd like to talk to you about community-based drug development. This is a rather recent concept and a rather new name for that concept, but really it's what we're all trying to do. I wanna to talk to you about how you can get treatment strategies ready to take to the FDA and how you can get treatment strategies ready to partner up with pharma companies. So how rare disease foundations can take a part in the drug development process. This is something we've been doing for a very long time. And I guess you could see that either as a, an inspirational story or a cautionary tale. <laughs> I'll let you be the judge. Uh, I am an expert in this subject. If you define an expert as a, a man who's made all the mistakes which can be made in a narrow field, because uh, I've made all the mistakes you can make in this field, and uh, I'd like to tell you all about it. First, I'll tell you a little bit about Fraxa. We're a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1994 by, by me and my wife. So that's how I got to be the medical director. I got in on the ground floor. Uh, we're <laughs> run entirely by Fragile X parents, uh, primarily me and my wife, but we've got a, a few other folks that work part-time and they're also Fragile X parents. And we've got a board of directors that are, guess what? Also Fragile X parents. So we're, we're dedicated to funding biomedical research. This is why we do community-based drug development. We're not doing advocacy. We're not doing awareness. We do those things along the way, and we think we do more of that because of our efforts to actually develop treatments for Fragile X. Uh, we funded, actually, by the time we get through with our current grant cycle, we're going to probably be right about $36 million in direct research grants. So that's not just our total revenues, but the amount that we've actually given away in biomedical research. So we're founded on the principle that Fragile X is a treatable condition. And I know you folks feel the same way about, about grins. And I, uh, I think this is fairly obvious now that we can do something about rare diseases. As we've heard from the FDA folks, they're approving drugs for rare diseases based on this kind of model. But this was pretty controversial when we first started out. And there were a lot of people within the community Fragile X parents and family who kind of got angry at us for suggesting the possibility that this was something that was a tractable problem. I think it's the experience we've had over the last few decades has uh, borne out this proposition. And I think most people feel like this is in fact a tractable condition. So check out the website if you get a chance, you can see what we're up to. I think it always helps to compare notes and see what the other guys are up to. That's why I'm here. We're doing this for the, the two most important reasons in the world, um, and their names are Andy and Laura. Andy's our son, who is now 33 years old. So we started this when Andy was a little toddler. <laughs> we actually launched this project before there actually was a 501c3. We got started right after Andy's third birthday. So we've really been at this now for a good 30 years. Um, Andy's sister, Laura, also has a full mutation of the, the Fragile X gene, uh, but she's a perfectly normal girl, woman, 31-year-old woman. She's married, she graduated from college, has a house in the suburbs and a nice job, perfectly normal in every way. Is she completely unaffected? Well, hard to say what she would have been like otherwise, but she's great just the way she is. So just a little bit about Fragile X, because I'm not really talking about Fragile X, I'm talking about this process. Fragile X is the most common inherited cause of mental retardation or intellectual disability, if you prefer the more politically correct terminology. Affects approximately one in 4,000 boys. One in 4,000 girls also have the full mutation, but about half the folks are like our daughter and they really don't have anything wrong with them because they have another X chromosome. It's the most common genetic cause of autism. At one point before the definition of autism was expanded, it was thought that up to 5% of the people with autism had fragile X. As we've had more uh, 
uh, genetic counseling, the number of people with fragile X has actually gone down while the number of people diagnosed with autism has gone up. Fragile X has a pretty subtle physical phenotype. You can recognize it if you're a parent or if you're a doctor who's treated lots of kids with fragile X, but most people miss it. They look pretty normal. Our son's a very handsome guy. Our daughter's a beautiful young lady, um, but they have a striking psychiatric phenotype. I'm a psychiatrist, I would say something like that. Uh, about 20 to 25, uh, 25 to 30% of full mutation males uh, meet the criteria for a diagnosis of autistic disorder. That is what I like to call big A autism. And just about everybody else has an autism spectrum disorder, which I often call little a autism. Um, so really fragile X is an important model for the study of autism. About 20 to 25% of males have seizures. Most of those folks don't really have lifelong seizure disorders. They may have a seizure here, a seizure there. Um, most of the time, the seizure disorders are pretty well controlled. Our son has the seizure disorder and it's, you know, it's reasonably well controlled, but he still has breakthrough seizures, even on three different anticonvulsants. Most importantly, fragile X is a true developmental disorder. It's not neurodegenerative. These folks have a normal life expectancy uh, and, and they don't really have a whole lot wrong with the brain, except that it doesn't seem to develop over time. So the basics of the actual mutation, X-linked, highly variable penetrance, it's caused by a trinucleotide repeat that it gets expanded over the course of generations. That leads to the gene getting shut down. The actual fragile site, which if I can point to it here, helped in locating the gene in identifying the gene during the human genome project because it's right where the fragile site in the gene is when you incubate chromosomes in a folate deficient medium. Uh, that's known as the fragile XA site or FRAXA. That's where we get our name from. Uh, actually, we didn't want to name it Fragile X anything because we thought it's kind of a misnomer and we don't want to name our foundation after a misnomer because we'll probably change the name. But as it turns out, it's stuck. So we're still Fraxa and this is still Fragile X. There we go. So that's the fragile site right there. So basically, it's, it's the absence of a single protein that causes Fragile X and the severity of the disease corresponds to uh, the deficiency in FMRP. And we've had a knockout mouse model basically since we started Fraxa, since we came on the scene. And as you can see, about a third of the people in this, in this study of uh, childhood autism rating scale at uh, the University of North Carolina meet the criteria for uh, autistic disorder. Uh, but then you've got this big fat part of the bell curve. These folks are all squarely in the ASD range. And then these kids are probably just too young and they haven't really developed the symptoms yet, but they will. So what are we trying to do? Uh, I think one of our former board members put it best and no coincidence, he was an MIT guy and an engineer. And he said, this is not basic science. This is an engineering project. We're engineering a solution for Fragile X. And I really like that. This is an engineering project. It's not basic science. It's applied science. And we, tongue in cheek refer to this as the FRAXA method. We fund basic research, which generates data about mechanisms of disease. We fund translational research, which picks up on those mechanisms of disease and tries to find therapeutic targets, things that you can go after to fix the disease or at least some of the mechanisms. And then we also fund preclinical validation studies where we test specific drugs that actually hit those targets that have been found through the translational research. And if we're successful, we have things that might make good drugs that we can take into clinical trials. Sometimes we actually fund the clinical trials if they're available drugs and we don't have a corporate sponsor. But a lot of times this preclinical validation really importantly, leads to partnerships with pharma companies. And at any given time these days, we have about 30 different active pharma partners. So we have a lot of different companies that we're working with, different types of companies, big companies, small companies, all the way in between. Some are looking at small molecules, some are looking at the more biotech approaches, the biologics, the ASOs and gene therapy. 
That's what it takes. Of course, this isn't the Fraxin method. This is just rational drug discovery. This is what every pharma company in the world does it, but we, we do it as a nonprofit and we do it on a shoestring budget. So we do what we can, but we can't do everything. And I think this applies to you guys as well. There are things you can do and there are things you should do, but you can't do everything. So you have to prioritize. This is community-based drug discovery. So when nonprofits do it to try to help their kids, community-based drug discovery. So let's, let's talk about some of these steps. Uh, what is it that we actually do and what should you be doing? Well, uh, one of the most important things is to develop mouse models. In your case, many mouse models, but in our case, even with a single genetic mutation, and, and in our case, we have just one kind of mutation for the most part. You guys have lots of different disorders affecting a number of different uh, genes, a number of different receptors, so you're going to need lots of mouse models. It's really important and it's something you can't really skip. A lot of folks nowadays, because I talk to a lot of rare disease foundations and consult with a lot of people about how to do this. And a lot of them think, well, we're just gonna bypass that with iPSCs and organoids and we're not gonna need any animal models because this is, this is cumbersome. And the characterization of the mouse models is time consuming, but you certainly need to do these things. And fortunately, creating the mouse models has gotten to be quite a bit quicker and easier and a lot cheaper than it used to be. There are other animal models that are useful too, and I would not rule out fish, fly, rat, and well, I would rule out primate models because they're really expensive. So that's something you might get to eventually, but uh, Drosophila fruit fly models in particular are really, really cheap and easy to work with. So you can generate all kinds of mutations in fruit flies and, and and spawn thousands of fruit flies, as anyone knows who's left the bananas out on the counter for too long. <laughs> uh, you, you can generate a lot of fruit flies in a very short time, and they're a great way of exploring genetics. Um, so don't rule that out. There are many different possibilities, and you may find that certain animal models suit certain disorders, but when it comes time to do preclinical validation, it's always nice to see that you can get a particular strategy to work in multiple species. Um, even if you do the, and I'm sure you're gonna do the, the iPSCs and the organoids, patient-derived cell models, you still need to characterize these and you need to standardize the protocols. One of the big problems in science that leads to the, the so-called reproducibility crisis is that everybody does things a different way. And that's especially true with stem cells and with uh, even, even cultured cells in, in labs. People handle them different ways and so you get completely different results. So you still need to characterize these and standardize things. Uh, providing reagents and the mouse models themselves um, and distributing all of these things can be really useful. There was a time when there was a, a real antibody crisis in the Fragile X research community. The antibodies didn't really distinguish the Fragile X protein from similar proteins, and it led to a lot of confusing results. And so we actually funded the development of monoclonal antibodies and distributed them. That's the sort of thing that you can do that's really helpful outside of the actual direct funding of projects, making resources available to the research community. When it comes time for translational elaboration, there are a number of techniques that have proven to be really valuable. Electrophysiology, often looking at cells or slices of brain is a really powerful technique because you can combine it with pharmacology and biochemistry. Imagine if you've got a, a little piece of a brain in a dish, you can just put anything in there with it that you want. You can manipulate it any way you want. And so you can explore the pharmacology of the, the problem that you're dealing with. In your case, you guys have some fairly straight straightforward mutations in, in receptors in, um, and in uh, ionotropic glutamate receptors that, that lend themselves nicely to the, this kind of pharmacology experiment. So you may find some surprising results when you start looking at this, and then you want to expand it out into live animals as you work your way along. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, everybody wants to look at proteomics, transcriptomics, and all the other omics, <laughs> metabolomics, and all the rest, uh, microbiomics. Uh, but survey these things. It's really important not to make assumptions about what it is that you're dealing with, because as I'll tell you later, you know, we've had some surprises along the way. Just when we thought we had everything figured out, it turned out that we didn't have it figured out at all. 
Uh, and it's also really difficult to sort out the primary pathology that results from the, the mutation versus the downstream secondary pathology versus compensatory responses that you see in the brain. If there's one thing the brain is really good at, it's, it's good at compensatory responses. Whenever there's a disruption in one area, it will respond to try to fix that. And the one thing you don't wanna do is identify a compensatory response and identify that as pathology and develop some treatment that's gonna wipe out your compensatory response and make everything worse. That's happened before. It's also important to study the disease state, not just the, the normal function. So there's lots of research that's been done on glutamate receptors, for example, but you need to study your disease models in depth because you can't assume that, that the disease is just the absence of that normal function. It usually spreads out beyond that. And you always want to incorporate rescue attempts, rescue paradigms in your studies. In other words, you want to incorporate in the basic research and the translational elaboration an effort to fix the problem at that stage. Because if you don't, then it may very well turn out that it's just a compensatory response. If you can't rescue it with the obvious approach that stems from the, the basic research finding, well, yeah, that's probably not a real finding. Let's see. The next stage, of course, is preclinical validation. So now you've identified a treatment target. You've got drugs. Maybe they're available drugs. Maybe they're drugs in development. Maybe they're just reagents that you order off the internet. But you've identified drugs that might actually fix this problem. Um, you've got to do the testing in live whole animals with a whole brain whenever you're dealing with a brain disorder. As a psychopharmacologist, I can just tell you the, the essential issue is that you're gonna be bathing the whole brain in that drug. And you need to know what that drug does to the whole brain, because there are lots of examples of circuits and brain formations where a particular kind of drug, say a serotonin drug, might do one thing in one place and it does the opposite thing in another place. And so you need to know how the balance works out. So standardized protocols, oops, I'm sorry. I meant to hit the laser pointer. Standardized protocols are, are essential because once again, different labs will do different things in different places with different methods. And not only that, but you know, a lot of academics, when they're working on a particular disease mechanism, they might test, for example, they might do 20 different behavioral tests on the animals and only four of them respond to their treatment strategy. And then that's what they publish. And they don't even mention the other 16 that didn't, didn't respond or went the other way. So there is a certain cherry picking that occurs. If you have a, a standardized testing protocol, perhaps what we do is we have a, a, a drug validation initiative, which is a lab which maintains a colony of Fragile X mice in the same place so it's the same mice in the same place and they do the same behavioral tests on multiple different uh, treatment strategies, usually small molecules, but also other things as well. Uh, and so we can compare those results and we can tell what's working and what's not working because a lot of things in the Fragile X mouse seem to work. You know, if you do five different behavioral tests and three of them respond, the academic says, wow, this works great. We know that's actually not a very good response. We need to, we need to take care of five out of five behavioral paradigms if we're going to actually take that thing into the clinic. So uh, we also found out, for reasons I'll explain soon, chronic dosing is important. Tolerance is common with any kind of brain disease. Um, the carryover effects are actually ideal. You want to see that you give a drug, it works, you stop the drug, and there's been some actual overall gain. Things don't just revert back to the way, way they were. That's more of a symptomatic and palliative kind of treatment. So like I said before, multiple levels, multiple species, that's really good too. So have those models if you have them, uh, if, you can, if you can get them. So let me give you an example of how this works in Fragile X. We're gonna flash back to 2000. A group that we're funding at Brown University by the superb neuroscientist, Mark Baer, and an excellent postdoc named Kim Huber, who's since gone on to become a renowned professor in her own right. We're working on a Fraxa grant to study this form of synaptic plasticity called metabotropic glutamate receptor, long-term depression. 
So this is a form of synaptic plasticity where group one metabotropic glutamate receptors get stimulated and that results in a weakening of the synaptic contact. LTP potentiation would be a strengthening of that contact. MGLUARs, MGLUAR1 and 5 cause a weakening when you agonize those receptors. So this process, they've been working on this for a while, this process was known to be protein synthesis dependent. And their theory going into this was that this form of synaptic plasticity would be abolished. What they found was that in the knockout mouse, you actually had twice as much of it. So far from being abolished, it was exaggerated. And this had immediate treatment implications because if you could then block this receptor, DHPG is the agonist. If you could block this receptor, you could restore this to this. And in fact, they did that in vitro. This is in slice physiology where you dissect out the hippocampus and cut it into thin slices and do electrophysiology. But it has immediate treatment implications. And so we wanted to test it in the whole mice. So we did that. So this is a Fraxa method. We go to the preclinical validation. And we use the reagent, not a human drug, MPEP, which is the prototype of the MGLUR5 antagonist, or it's actually a negative allosteric modulator, but MGLUR5 NAM in the Fragile X mice. And we're, we're doing the audiogenic seizure paradigm um, because at the time that was the mo most robust phenotype that we had. And it seemed relevant too, uh, but it takes a lot of mice to do audiogenic seizures because a lot of them go into status epilepticus and they die, even though that doesn't typically happen to humans. In the mice, that did happen. Uh, but we saw that if you treated them with MPEP in a dose response fashion, they improved significantly and you pretty much eliminated all the audiogenic seizures. This is just with acute dosing, single dose of MPEP, and then you just do this an hour later. And we saw the same effect on open field activity. They were hyperactive, and there was very little effect on the wild types. That's not significant, but at high doses, you do see a little bit of slowing of the wild type mice. These are their actual litter mates that don't have the mutation, and the fragile X mice uh, slow down when you give them some MPEP. So that's great. Uh, I don't want you to get the idea that we just did that little experiment and all the pharma companies said, all right, we're on board. No, 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 no. No, it was another five or six years and several million dollars worth of preclinical validation and de-risking studies to convince pharma companies that this was something that was worth pursuing. But basically every pharma company in the world was developing MGLUR5 agonists for a wide variety of indications for anxiety disorders, mood disorders, uh, uh, various kinds of dependency, cocaine, cocaine abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, all kinds of different things, Parkinson's disease. So we thought, wow, this, these are impressive drugs that have a wide range of activities. And a lot of those are relevant to Fragile X. We finally made the contacts and started doing the, uh, doing the studies. First company out of the gate was a small company called Neurofarm that picked up an older drug that had never quite made it to market, but turned out to be an MGLUR5 antagonist. Um, but they unfortunately went out of business because their, their lead compound failed. Same thing with Seaside Therapeutics. They licensed a Merck compound that was a little bit more advanced drug. Uh, their lead compound went out of business. But then Roche and Novartis conducted large-scale international clinical trials, spent more than $50 million on this. And it all came up negative. <laughs> Didn't work at all. Uh, we never really got all the results from Roche, but uh, the Novartis folks were pretty open in publishing theirs. And in fact, they got a dose-dependent worsening in, uh, in the subjects in the clinical trials. So it didn't work. So is this a problem with the method? Uh, I hope it's not because we have validated a lot of other treatment targets for Fragile X using these same methods. Although I will say we've also gone to more chronic dosing because we, we knew that there was a potential issue with tolerance developing. But the pharma guys basically just dismissed that and said, nah, you don't get tolerance to an antagonist. No, it just doesn't happen. Well, that's exactly what we saw in the clinical trials. So this is an iterative process, thinking about it in engineering terms. We've got a development cycle. We know we have a problem. 
We do the basic research. We, do, we identify the mechanisms of disease. We do the translational research to identify the treatment targets. We test the specific drugs and hopefully get them into clinical trials. If that works, well, we just sail off into the sunset because we're all done. Uh, more often than not, it doesn't, and you need to spin the cycle again. And you typically need to spin the cycle a whole bunch of times, especially for CNS disorders. And I just wanted to let you know that we finally did get a break because one of those other targets was phosphodiesterase 4, PDE4. In this case, we have a specific selective drug that's PDE4D uh, inhibitor. And you can see the preclinical results showed that uh, this is your phenotype in open field, hyperactive knockouts. And you give them the drug and it rescues that. Social interactions, deficient in fragile X, give them the drug and all of a sudden they're equal to wild type, wild type litter mates um, and, and so on. And the really cool thing is you probably think I made some kind of cut and paste error here and I just put this on twice, but this is two weeks of dosing. This is two weeks on the drug then two weeks off the drug and they're still rescued after two weeks. We get a really pronounced carryover effect. Um, we also saw an effect on the spine morphology, the actual structure of the neurons. And of course, the best thing of all is when it translates in a clinical trial. And here it did. We saw uh, broad improvements on uh, cognition with the NIH toolbox, the uh, ABC scale, uh, excuse me, this is the uh, visual analog scale. Um, the KITAP, which is a computer-based uh, performance assessment, uh, didn't show any changes really, and that, that has happened in a number of studies. We're going to drop this one. Um, but the ABC scale, we saw responses which were positive across the board. That's this direction, um, but not always statistically significant. Uh, more importantly, we saw the same carryover effect, that the folks that were on the drug for 12 weeks then off the drug for 12 weeks, roughly the equivalent of two weeks for a mouse, uh, retained a lot of these gains. They didn't go back to baseline. So that was pretty cool. So we've done a number of things right. We've done a number of things wrong. Uh, but one of the things we did was to focus on the neurodevelopmental disorder. You may know that there are other associated conditions in carriers. Uh, we basically ignore those because we figure we can only do so much and these are different diseases. Uh, we develop actual therapeutics. So I would urge you to swing for the seats. Don't just settle for awareness, support or training. Um, this is something that you can do. You can make a difference, even if you can't take it end to end. And uh, we also funded a number of resources over the years, not just funding research projects, the mouse models distribution. Uh, we've got conditional knockouts and a number of different, even though we have one gene, we have a number of different mouse models to study that. Uh, reagents like antibodies and MPEP, the stuff that I was talking about. We funded the distribution of that. We literally had a big old mayonnaise jar full of MPEP synthesized and just started passing it out at meetings. And there was no better way to get people to test your compound than to hand them some for free. <laughs> but um, oh, wait a second, just a, a couple more things. Meetings, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pushing the wrong button. Um, meetings are a great idea. We started out small with these Banbury meetings that had 36 investigators in an intimate environment. We expanded to Fraxa investigators meetings that had about 150 people in big conferences. So imagine something this size, but just with the researchers that we were funding. Um, and, and then um, we got tired of paying for that and the Gordon Research Conferences agreed to actually do a series on Fragile X and, and related autism conditions, which is ongoing now. Um, and I would also put in a, a vote for repurposing of available drugs, maybe a rational repurposing. So you, you have targets of opportunity that emerge over time as you're studying these things. Um, go after them and do the clinical trials. I think this is a great way to get good at doing clinical trials. Uh, contract research is also really important because there are sometimes things that the investigators just won't do spontaneously, but you identify them as a critical need. Well, put out an RFA for those things and fund them yourself. Uh, it's mostly not as expensive as you think. It's, it's certainly a, a lot less expensive than just rooting around in the dark. So uh, the, the regrets that we have over the years is that we focused a little bit too narrowly 
And it's the paradox of getting results. We figured out right away what FMRP did, or so we thought, but it turns out it does more than just regulate activity dependent protein synthesis. And not only that, but it's not just postsynaptic, it's presynaptic too. And it's doing something completely different in axons. And it's doing, you, you just assume it's doing one thing. We figured out the one thing it was doing. Nope, nope, not at all. Uh, and then it turns out it's not just working in neurons, it's working in the astrocytes and the microglia as well. Uh, and then it turns out it's not just the brain, it's having effects on metabolism as well. So don't limit yourself. You want to think about all of these possibilities. And another thing that's important to keep in mind is that drug repositioning, so drugs in development, drugs that are not available now, is harder than, it's, than we expected because often failure is a prerequisite. A lot of times companies won't allow you to work with their compound unless it's already failed for something else. And that was the case with the MGLUR5 drugs. They'd been through trials for anxiety disorders and depression, and they'd failed in those trials. And then they said, okay, you guys can have a shot at it now. So now we're using a drug that we know doesn't work. Um, and that's a problem. But then again, the Tetra drug that gave us those nice effects that I showed you, the phosphodiesterase, uh, yeah, that phosphodiesterase inhibitor is, uh, was in, in large scale trials for Alzheimer's disease. And they just took a risk on Fragile X because we had really compelling preclinical data and, and a really nice package to show them. So drug repurposing is really powerful and you should consider it at every opportunity. You guys have the advantage of having some potentially very druggable targets. Uh, glutamate is not an easy target, but at least it's there on the cell surface and we know what we're dealing with. So thanks very much for for listening and happy to entertain any questions and hope this helps you to kind of think about how you want to plan your strategy in the years ahead. So now we'll open up for one question on the floor and we're running a little bit behind. So we'll take about a 10 minute break and be back in here for Dr. Keith Kaufman's next keynote. Am I on? Okay, that was an excellent presentation. Um, you know, I think you uh, probably started before the era of gene therapy and, um, you know, a lot of research into that. Have you shifted your, um, you know, your goals and strategies because of that development? And how has that worked? It's a good question because we actually started right during the first wave of gene therapy. And that was what we assumed we were gonna be doing. So we started when uh, Genzyme, which is located not too far from here, uh, was doing protein replacement for Gaucher's disease. And they were working on gene therapy protocols for a number of different disorders. And we thought, you know, we don't need to do this whole foundation route. That's a real pain in the neck. Why, why go to all that trouble? We could just talk Genzyme into doing all of this stuff for us. Um, so we tried doing that and we actually got a lot farther than we probably should have. <laughs> they were very nice and they listened to us. Uh, but then, as you probably know, there were a few disasters clinically that happened in the early round of gene therapy. So in the early 90s, not only that, but there was this whole issue around healthcare reform and there was a lot of uncertainty in the biotech investment market. And so we, we got the impression and we got the... Uh, message from Genzyme that, you know, you guys need to characterize these models a little bit better, understand the mechanisms of disease and just do a little work on this and then circle back to us. So sure enough, <laughs> after, uh, after 25 years or so, we did circle back to these folks and we are actually working with a number of companies that are interested in gene therapy. But also because we've characterized the actual mutation well enough, we've identified targets for ASOs as well. So for those of you, I, you probably had some presentations already on, on antisense oligonucleotides. They're great for knocking things out. They're not so great for turning things back on. So we're missing something. So we wanna turn something back on. Well, it turns out that there is a, they, they call them poison exons in, in ASO work. So there, there is a misplicing event in Fragile X that results in a, a, a mutant splice variant that basically gums up the works. And if you can make an ASO to that mutant splice variant, you can just turn the gene back on. And you find that in about 75% of the people with Fragile X. So, so we've now got a company that's launching that's gonna be doing ASO therapeutics, but we've also got six or seven companies that are interested in gene therapy uh, and a couple of other companies that are interested in 
uh, other kinds of gene reactivation and protein replacement as well. So we like to call these definitive therapies. And when we had this ASO breakthrough, we decided we were actually going to hold a special meeting. So we're holding a special meeting at the end of April for um, discussion of these definitive therapeutics and how you're going to develop them. For example, we have a knockout mouse. The mouse does not have a trinucleotide repeat expansion. The mouse doesn't make this poison exon. It doesn't make any exons. It produces nothing, it produces no mRNA whatsoever. Um, so we're, we've got to study this in other systems. We still need to make some kind of animal model as the final validation step for this. Um, so that's one of the issues that we have to contend with now because of this breakthrough. So even after 30 years, you know, these things pop up that you didn't anticipate, but it's, it's good. It's serendipitous and we're really happy about that.